Okay, so hello everyone. I am Dennis. Uh, oh, ev hello, everyone knows me already. Uh, Hacking networks made easy. I'm just I'm just gonna get right into it because I don't like that title. Uh, so I'm Dennis. Nice to meet all of you. Uh, I, I I am on Twitter. Please find me on Twitter. Contact me. Hit me up. Everything. Uh, I, I I love Twitter. Twitter is great for the InfoSec community. Uh, but I am a adversarial engineer. My favorite title so far. Uh, I work for Lars Consulting, and I do pretty much everything red team, uh, full scope, physical, electronic, all that stuff. A lot of you know me for my physical security talks. This is not one of those. So if you're here for that, mm, you, can, you can leave. Uh, but uh, some of my credentials, I, I did start a, a red team for a very large organization. Uh, I, I can't say the name, but people, some people know it. Others can guess. Uh, it's, it's, it's been going on for 15 months now. It's been massively successful. Uh, so I have a lot of experience in what I'm about to talk about. Uh, and also, for those of you who, who, who here is from Houston? Oh, who here likes Houston? <laughs> I, I, I already know the answer. See, we got one right there. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? Hold on. Come here. Don't, don't follow me, camera guy. Oh my God. Thank you so much. <laughs> he asked me... No. He asked me, hey, during your talk, sometimes just come up and shake my hand. I'll feel really honored. It's like, I'll do it. Uh, anyways, so I host Houston Locksport. We meet up every third Wednesday, uh, and it's just a place, uh, a, a, a meetup for us to get together every month and pick locks and drink beers and eat. So it's really cool. And then also HaHa, -Ha, based off of AHA, Houston Area Hackers Anonymous. We meet up every first Thursday, and we, do, we just hack stuff and just share knowledge and collaborate. It's really awesome. It's really jump-started the InfoSec community in Houston. So if you're ever there, hit me up. Check it out. Uh, and also, I've, I have spoken in the last two DEF CONs. Uh, I do plan on speaking on this next one if I get accepted. So enough about me. So what are we going to talk about today? So the point of my talk is to kind of give people the sense that uh, for those who run security of their organizations, that maybe they shouldn't focus on uh, buying the latest and greatest tools for defenses and security, maybe they need to focus on taking a step back and improving your initial security posture, maybe work on some configuration issues, secure practices, stuff like that. So I'll be talking a lot about that for this. That, that's kind of the point of this talk. Uh, and so the agenda is, first I'll give a background for those who are newer, uh, kind of what red team versus blue team is, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about network security and focus on internal security. Uh, and then we'll, I'll go into, okay, how do you get started uh, with starting to improve your security posture, uh, and then go into low-hanging fruit. So I'll talk uh, quite a few techniques on just the things that we find almost every pen test, the issues that we find that can be easily and should be easily remediated and should be taken care of first before you start worrying about, okay, what's the latest endpoint detection software or next-gen antivirus I should buy. Um, and then we'll just summarize, summary and Q&A. Uh, we probably will run out of time, but last talk, so I'll go a little bit over. You guys can all just leave if you don't want it. Uh, so, all right, let's jump into the background. So, red versus blue. So, the red team, the, it consists of the attackers, the, the adversarial simulators. Uh, they identify and test for potential vulnerabilities in your organization, and they, they simulate adver uh, adversarial attacks. They actually simulate actual attacks from malware, from APT groups, from, you know, anything malicious. Uh, and then the blue team, they're the defenders. They protect the environment from the uh, attacks like these, and they build detections and protections for those attacks and techniques uh, and that the red team helps identify. Uh, one thing I like to stress is that it is never a contest. It should never be a contest between red and blue. It should never be where the blue gets angry at the red for cheating or they knew the environment, and the red should never be angry at the blue for sucking, as a lot of people like to say. Uh, it's never a contest. It is a collaborative effort. To, for, uh, you both have the goal of improving the security of your organization, so you both should work together to do that. Red team finds vulnerabilities. Blue team fixes them. Blue team asks red to verify, and they just back and forth. Uh, blue team should also be protecting its actual adversaries. Don't, don't fall into the trap of defending against tools or pen testers. Defend against actual adversaries. You can block mimicats.exe all you want, but if you're not actually detecting LSAS process injection, you're not really doing your company any good. Um, uh, and that's, that's kind of the next point I went over is don't defend against the tools, defend against the techniques. Uh, so jumping into network security, what are the differences? External versus internal. External, it's usually the entry point, and 
you know, it's, it's an arguable point, but it's, e it's relatively easy to monitor. You usually have a lot less uh, external facing assets than you do internal. Uh, uh, so it's relatively easy to lock down because there's not a lot of entry points uh, and there's usually less exposure. Well, at least there should be, right? Where you have internal security, it's always a target of adversaries. When someone's trying to break into your company, they're trying to get access to your internal assets so they can steal proprietary data, for example, or infect, uh, get, start a malware infection in your environment uh, and just gain access to all the sensitive systems and data that, that you have. Um, internal security, there's more risk because of all the sensitive servers and data that you have in the network, uh, but it's usually given less attention. I, I hear that a lot where uh, companies or people don't want to, don't really care about the internal network or testing it because it's a trusted network, right? Uh, you, only employees have access to that. But what if you have one of these, right? A physical intruder. Someone physically breaks into your environment uh, and b breaks into the building and plugs into your Ethernet port. Now what? You don't have any internal protections or detections, so now that person can run rampant and do whatever they want. Uh, malicious insiders, bad employees, someone who goes rogue, someone who maybe didn't get the raise he wanted or wants to, uh, knows he's going to get fired and just wants to do bad, right? Who's seen office space? Someone, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name, but he creates a, 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 some malware that steals pennies. And Michael Bolton, thank you. Hey, what's that stapler guy's name? Milton. I love Milton. Milton's so awesome. Uh, yeah, malicious, malicious insiders. You never know when someone's going to go rogue and want to do bad to your network. Uh, and then, of course, malware infections. Uh, uh, just had someone tell me that they got infected by ransomware. How did they get infected? They either clicked a link or perhaps they picked up a USB drive from the floor, plugged it in, and boom, they got infected. SCADA, right? Like the, 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 the Stuxnet. That's how that happened. Uh, so internal network is really important because that's just that's where all the risk lies. So getting started. So I'll talk about just, a, there's so much you need to do with getting started, but I'm going to touch on a few points here. Because the, the, the point of this talk is not about how to start your own security organization. It's to help improve it. But uh, avoid falling into a purchasing trap. Don't focus on, OK, I need to buy the latest and greatest tools. At least not yet. You, you, you don't need to focus on that yet. You just need to focus on, do I have secure configurations? Do I have secure practices, secure password policies? Uh, Focus on securing your initial security posture. Develop sec those secure practices. Uh, eliminate insecure configurations. We're going to talk about a lot of those uh, examples today. And defend against basic attacks. Basic attacks that are really easy to defend now, it's just they, they still work. And I still see them time and time again. Uh, and, and all of this can be done with little to no money. You can go to AD. You can push out group policy object uh, settings. And that doesn't cost you a dime, except for the however your time is worth. Um, uh, and one thing I like to stress is asset management. It's hard to protect what you don't know exists. You, you, you need to have some way of knowing what you have so you know how to protect it. Uh, do you know every device on your network? Hell, do you know every network on your network? Like, you, usually, uh, especially for the larger organizations, they don't have a central repository or, or uh, system that manages all of that, and so they never know oh, this device is here and I don't recognize it. They, they, no one knows what it does. Um, which devices are supposed to be there? Do you, is there a Raspberry Pi on the network that shouldn't be there? Did someone put a rogue access point? Who knows? Uh, who has access to those devices? For the devices that you do know there, do you know who, ha who has access to those? Or maybe how they are configured? Or what data is stored on those devices? Maybe some employees have their laptops they take overseas and it has your crown jewels. Do you know that? Uh, and, if, and if it does, is, do you take additional protections to protect that laptop? And then, of course, what are they connected to? Are they connected to your L4 net, uh, sorry, your, ex, uh, your internal network? Or are they connected to your, the internet? Or are they connected to both? Right? Because that's additional risk, right? So asset management is one of the really important things. But this is not an asset management talk. So, so let's go into the low-hanging fruit. And, and we're going to talk about two different types of low-hanging fruit. Pre-authentication, this is where uh, an attacker gets on your network but doesn't have credentials. Uh, they just get on your network, they plug into the Ethernet, they have a, a Kali box on it. What can they do? What kind of attacks can they do on your network? And then for each one of these techniques we're going to discuss, uh, we're going we're to have actionable items that you can take home today for the red team and actionable items you can take home today for the blue team on what you can do, red team, how you can test for these things, and blue team, what you can do to detect and protect against this technique. I also have live demos. I have this really awesome Intel Nook device. This is a full ESX iLab with 
like seven Windows VMs running. So I'm gonna try to live demo uh, for you today, but guarantee you something's gonna go wrong. I do have backup videos. So, so NBTNS LMR, who knows about LLMNR poisoning? AKA the responder tool does this. Uh, I, this is probably the most technical portion of the talk, so I'll try to, I'll, I, I wanna keep it high level, but I'll, I'll try my best to go through this. So NBTNS and LMNR, NBTNS stands for NetBIOS Name Service and Link Layer Multicast Name Resolution. NetBIOS Name Service is just Windows XP and older. LLMNR is the successor for Windows Vista and up. Uh, what it is, is it's the last resort for name resolution. So if a computer wants to contact a specific, specific server via its name and the DNS server doesn't know about it, it's gonna ask the network, hey, is anyone this guy? Uh, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean with this graph later. Uh, so what it does is it broadcasts these name resolution, resolution requests to the entire subnet. Every computer on that network, on that subnet, is gonna get a request, hey, are you this? And they're gonna respond back if that, that computer is that person. Uh, and it only works on the same subnet, so that's important. So uh, it doesn't work across subnets, it doesn't work over a router, it just works on the same subnet. So what do I mean? I have a graph here. You have the victim on the bottom left, there's a DNS server, and there's two just clients connected to the network, just normal computers. You have the victim. The victim wants to access file server 01. So it asks the DNS server, hey, who's file 01? The DNS server has no idea because that record doesn't exist. So this victim is going to broadcast to the entire network, hey, who is file 01? And these computers are not gonna respond back because they're not file 01, so they're just gonna ignore that packet, uh, and that's the end of that. But what if we introduce an attacker to the network? The attacker is gonna get that packet as well, and he's gonna be like, oh yeah, I'm file 01, cool. So now what the victim's gonna do is, oh good, I found file 01, I want to authenticate to you. So he's, the file, uh, victim is gonna send our attacker the domain credentials to authenticate to that file server, and now the attacker's happy because the attacker has those credentials and can start cracking them and do what they want. That's the basis of LLMNR poisoning. Super, sim super simple attack. I know it kind of looks a little complex, uh, but it's very easy to do. So, red team. You can see the big red border. That means it's the red team slide. What, what can you do to test against this? Well, there's a few tools you can use this. There's responder.py. It's a Linux tool uh, based on Python that can do all this automatically. Uh, Metasploit has uh, some uh, uh, auxiliary modules to do as well. And then there's Envay. For those who love PowerShell, who loves PowerShell? World's best hacker tool. Love it. Uh, there is a PowerShell implementation where you can do this kind of attack as well. So, talking about responder specifically, steps. Get access to the network. No credentials required. Just, hey, like, go behind a printer and put a Raspberry Pi back there. No one will ever notice. Or just get a laptop on, uh, on an Ethernet port. Uh, and then launch responder and wait. All you have to do is just launch responder and wait. It's gonna automatically listen for these packets and it's gonna respond back, oh, that's me, and it's gonna take those credits. Once you have those credits, crack them with your favorite cracking tool, Hashcat John the Ripper, uh, and then use those credentials to actually access the network. So, I have a video, but let's do this by hand. Let's try it. Uh, let's see if we can see this. I have a screen down here. Uh, so, cool, I have a Kali box. I'm gonna get to my responder. So, tools, responder. Okay, so I'm on this, uh, like I said, I have a big network. You can kind of see in the left, there's a lot of servers. There's a, it's a domain network. Uh, this Kali box is on the network as well, but not authenticated. It's just on the network. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Responder, tell it use my e Ethernet card. So now it's, it's listening. It's just waiting for anything. Uh, so what I'm going to do to accelerate this process, I could just wait and I'll eventually get something, but to accelerate the process, I'm going to just type incorrectly uh, an SMB share. So you can't see that, but you don't have to worry about it. I'm just typing in a name that doesn't exist, right? And nothing happens, but if you go back to Cali, oh, what happened? Uh, let's do that again. I knew the demo was gonna fail. Oh, I typed the name wrong. I put a special character in there. Okay, so there you go. So now that user that was logged into that machine that typed the print server name wrong, his, it's J Doe for John Doe. I have his full NTLM v2 hash. So what can we do with that? Well, I can copy that entire hash to a file. Let's do that. Copy, close that, vi hash.txt. And I already have it up there. And so all I have to do is use John, I hope, you, can you guys see that? Is that good? I can use John, uh, yeah, let's use John the Ripper. So where is it? Uh, just John. I'll use a word list, the rocky word list, and give it hash.txt. And now it's gonna actually start trying to crack that password. And if we're lucky, in a few seconds, we'll have that password. 
And there it is. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, summer 2016, that's John Doe's password. And now we have John Doe's password just by listening for certain requests on a network and then replying to those requests. Super easy, right? Why haven't you guys defended against it yet? Who's defended against that? Anyone? Okay, well, let's talk about how you can defend against it. Um, let's get that going. Blue team. So blue border means the blue team slide. What can we do to defend against that? Well, there's a few things you can do. First, starting with detection, there's really not a lot of good things you can do to detect this kind of attack. It's, it's, you're not really exploiting a vulnerability. You're just kind of taking advantage of how Windows works. Uh, but you can, if you really want to, there's tools out there. You can make your own tools that can, like scripts that can actually send LLMNR packets out. And if it gets a response for one that shouldn't exist, then you know maybe someone's doing something bad. Uh, but the main things you can do here for, is for protection, disable MBTNS uh, uh, domain-wide. You, if you have a good DNS setup, if you have a good DNS server and good configuration, you don't need a fallback name resolution service. So disable DNS, you can do that through, uh, if you use Windows DHCP, you can do that through that options, or you can push out a registry key change that does have to be pushed out to every workstation and server, but that can be done. But you also have to disable LMNR. You have to disable both, because one is just gonna fall back to the other if, if they fail. So disable LMNR is a lot easier. It's just a GPO, group policy object. Uh, the, uh, it's in the DNS client. It's just what, I forgot what it's called, name resolution, whatever. Uh, but yeah, you can disable that. Uh, and by the way, these slides will be online. And at the end of these slides, there's links to references that have this uh, post in detail on how you can fix this stuff. Uh, and another thing you can do to protect against this is SMB signing. SMB signing is uh, a way for you to verify the authenticity of SMB packets. So you can enable that on uh, your Active Directory environment if you're a specific, I forgot, what is it, Windows Server uh, Domain 2012 or whatever the domain working environment is. So SMB signing is something you can look into. And of course, network segmentation. Consider seg segregating your assets. Maybe servers and workstations, have them in different networks, or have your more important servers on a different network than your least important servers. That, that just kind of helps remediate uh, some of these issues. OK, moving on. So next one. How am I doing on time? I think I'm good. Uh, default passwords. Who here uses default passwords? Everyone raise your hand, because everyone's used a default password. You bought a router from Best Buy, right? And you didn't change the password immediately. Uh, default passwords, they're everywhere. Third-party software, third-party hardware, everywhere. Or even first-party hardware and software. Uh, changing the password is often overlooked. Uh, a lot of people will set something up and then deploy it to prod and forget, oh crap, I should have changed the password. Um, a lot of software examples, for those who do a lot of pen testing and red teaming, they have CDs, they see Apache Tomcat, it, the username and password is just Tomcat Tomcat, JBoss, DRAC for Dell Remote Access, SAP, all that stuff. Um, and even hardware, printers and embedded devices like cameras and stuff. Here's a few examples. You have an Apache, uh, 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 an Apache Tomcat server. The default password is Tomcat Tomcat. And so now you have full access to this manager panel. And what does that give you? Well, as you see there, you can now upload Java code to that. And once you can upload Java code, you can take control of the entire server. Um, Jenkins. Someone mentioned Jenkins earlier. That was you. Yes, thanks, Dave. Uh, Jenkins, it, it's groovy, as someone said. That was hilarious. Uh, once you have access to a Jenkins console, because default password, what do you have there? You can write groovy in there, which is pretty much Java. Am I right? Uh, am I right about that, Dave? It's, it's, it's code that will execute server side. And so you have full control of that server um, just by having access to that panel. Uh, another, oh, so this one's fun. Uh, printers. No one cares about printers, they're just printers. Someone gets access, oh cool, they can check the ink levels, right? Mm, sometimes it's a little worse than that. This printer allows people on the domain to print to the servers from their Active Directory accounts, which means it's authenticated to the Active Directory and there's passwords in there. So when we got admin access to that printer's interface with default passwords, we now have that printer's domain credentials, which means now we're on the domain uh, with, with valid credentials. So, even printers shouldn't be overlooked. So red team slide, what can you do for red team? Well, scan the network and identify 
in this case, web applications, can, but it can be more than web applications. You can do, here's a little example, Nmap. You can Nmap port 80 and 8080. You can scan for those ports on an entire subnet and pull back what's open, and you can actually check those web interfaces, see what they are, and if they have default passwords. Um, check each web application for default passwords. You can do that manually, or you can do Zach Grace. Uh, he's, he's a cool dude. He wrote a script called Change Me that's on his GitHub uh, that will actually, you can give it a IP address, an IP address, or a network. It'll automatically detect uh, what any applications running on that and try the default passwords and report back. So that's really cool. It does it automatically. Um, and of course, once, once you have a console or admin access to whatever application, then you can work on elevating that access. If you have access to the application, then try to get access to the entire server or identify any sensitive data or exploit other servers and services that have the same issues. Um, so blue team, what can we do to, to, to protect, and protect against that? Well, this is a lot more obvious. First, with detections, monitor logs for failed password attempts. For the, you know, your more important apps, uh, actually look at the logs and look for people trying to guess the password. Um, and even some, for some of your apps, monitor for valid login attempts. If you have apps that are crucial, but you don't log into them a lot, uh, then maybe have an alert that someone has logged into it and you can see, oh, that was me, that's okay, or oh, that was not me, let me investigate that. Um, and another thing that I, I wish I could talk about more, but time won't let me, is send your logs to a SIM, a security inf information and event management. That's, go that's gonna be a, a device like Elk or Splunk or whatever that will help you centralize your logs for a lot easier monitoring and even alerts. So you can get alerts when, say, you have four log login failed att uh, attempts in 15 minutes. Um, you're gonna hear that recommendation a lot. And then of course, protection, super obvious and in bold, change all the default passwords. Don't forget, when you get a device, change it immediately. Uh, and then when you're deploying it to prod, make sure it's changed and change it again. Uh, change your default passwords, it's very important. Uh, and considering disabling or limiting, limiting management consoles you don't need. If you have a bunch of Tomcat and you don't really need the admin console, disable them or firewall them off so only a certain person or certain IP can get access to them. So default passwords, moving in, moving along to common environment passwords, a little bit different, same issues, but instead of being default, it's common environment passwords. Who here has seen spring 2016 or something like season and year, right? For those who do pen tests, that's probably one of the first guesses you're gonna try, like summer 2016 or so. Uh, lots of people like to use, especially developers, and I'm not railing on developers, but they do have a hard job of doing a lot of development work and working on a lot of servers at once, so they kind of want to have easy passwords. But having easy passwords like summer 2016 or winter 2012 or whatever on your workstation servers, databases, applications, anything, uh, can be a huge risk in your environment. Um, and not only that, you also have like company specific. These are, these are just random examples I came up with. I'm not crapping on Walmart or IBM. Just, I just literally typed whatever I can think of that's not my company, um, but like I've seen that a lot as well. Walmart 2017 or you know, just a year, uh, the company name or the company stock ticker and a year. Um, and it's, it's just super easy to guess. So potential targets for looking for those account, accounts like that is like user accounts, service accounts, provisioning accounts, accounts that you use to join computers or domain, uh, common shared administrators, and of course developer accounts and developer servers. Um, uh, all of those are, I mean, everything's at risk of having these kinds of passwords. So, red slide. What can we do with that? So, like I said earlier, get an inventory of workstations and servers. Again, here's another Nmap example. Let's say we're targeting Windows servers specifically. You can scan port 445 uh, uh, on, on the network, and for things that come back to you, it's going to be more than likely a Windows server. Might be a honeypot, but, you know, that's not my problem, it's your problem. Uh, so, scan for that, or you can even use PowerShell. If you're already authenticated to the network, you can use PowerShell to query the Active Directory and say, hey, give me all the computers that are a member of this domain, and it'll give you everything. And that's just how, how Active Directory works. You're not hacking anything. Um, once you have that, find a common username to guess. Let's say, let's guess administrator. Let's, you know, if we find the password for administrator, we have admin access to that computer. Uh, and then once you have, once you kind of choose a name, brute force, uh, uh, try, a, try a common password like summer 2016 on all those servers that you found on the environment with the username administrator. And don't worry about lockout because 
you're only gonna try each server once, right? Make sure you dedupe your list, try each server once, and there's no risk of locking out. Also, if you're trying the local administrator, the SID 500 user, you can't lock those out. Uh, but yeah, so you're gonna try each once, and you're just gonna look for the, all the servers that have this password as the administrator account. And if you're in a big environment with thousands of servers and workstations, guarantee you're gonna find something. Try different passwords, but don't try enough. Look at the lockout policy first. So let me show you a, a quick demo of doing that. I'm gonna show you the PowerShell way because it's super fun. So again, I am on an active directory. I have a PowerShell console for a, this workstation is joined to, the domain, joined to the domain. So can you see that text? So what I'm gonna do, I already queued everything up, so let's see if I have it. So I'm gonna use the built-in uh, AD commandlets in PowerShell, get-ad computer, uh, and I'm just gonna tell it filter star, so give me everything back. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna ask the domain controller, give me all the computers. And here it's really quick, because I got a really small network, but uh, for bigger networks, it's still really fast, and it looks cooler, because you got it scrolling all over the place. But it'll come back with all the computer names, and so all you have to do, is copy and paste that to your Kali box or whatever you want to use to, to, to attack the network. And let me get this demo ready. I'm gonna use a tool called CrackMap. Uh, who here has used CrackMap? It's an awesome tool. It's a Windows Swiss Army knife uh, used for hacking Windows and doing whatever you want to do. So if I find the, there you go. I have a bunch of notes so I don't forget all this stuff. So I already have a servers.txt with the servers in it. So one, two, three, four, five, six servers. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to write a for loop and uh, let's see it. If you can see down there, it's just a for loop that uses crack map. It, it tells it for, uh, for every server, use the server, authenticate as the user administrator, the local administrator, not the domain administrator, and the password spring 2017. So let's run that. And you, so you can see the red, it's trying the computers, and of course, that's not the password, so it's red, but then you find that one computer, there it is, workstation one, login successful. And that computer has a local administrator with the password of spring 2017. And now I've got full local admin on that box, so then I can start working to uh, laterally move on the network, steal creds on that box, and start trying to attack other boxes. Um, so that's kind of the risk of having easy to guess kind of vendor or client specific passwords. Um, let's move on. Blue team. So what can you guys do for that? Well, detection, uh, log, again, log fail login attempts, especially with Windows event log, it's very useful, especially if you use something like syslog or Splunk event forwarder that can forward all this to a centralized repository. You can log these failed login attempts and alert on Windows, like someone is uh, failed, uh, is trying to log in on multiple boxes at a short period of time. Uh, again, send the logs to a sim so it's easier to monitor all of them and get alerts on them. And like I said, alert on failed attempts on multiple machines. So if you have one IP address trying to authenticate to multiple machines like really quickly, that's a big red flag that should be investigated. And protection. And of course, implement a good security policy. Uh, don't allow weak passwords like summer 2017 where you don't have special characters or anything like that. Um, the, the, the password policy debate can, is a really long, like a lot of people have different opinions. I just threw a random recommendation is having like upper lower numbers, special characters, at least 10 characters in my opinion, have, enforce these good password policies to prevent easy to guess passwords. Um, and of course, avoid, avoid grandfathering users into the old policy. So if you do upgrade your password policy, don't allow existing users to stay on the old one. Force them to change as well. And most importantly, uh, uh, executives don't get special treatment. I've, I've seen that where the CEO doesn't want to type a password, so he gets, he gets to have no password on his laptop or gets to have a, uh, a, like a super weak six character lowercase password. Don't allow that to happen, because especially because executives are going to be uh, your main target, right? People want to attack the big executive of this big oil and gas company because they think he has all the power. Um, and then a quick point on non-standard administrator passwords is try not to have the same local administrator password on all your computers. Make sure it's different. You can do that manually, or there's tools like a Microsoft-provided LAPS, local admin password solution, is a tool from Microsoft 
that will uh, allow you to manage your local administrator passwords on all your workstations so that they're all different and they're all rotated regularly. So, passwords. We're, I think we're done with passwords for now. Uh, sticky keys. Who has seen my DEF CON talk on sticky keys? Who knows the sticky keys? Sticky keys, it's great. It's, uh, uh, you know, when you press, let's, let's do it. Can I do it? Can I press shift five times? Okay, I can't do it. Uh, but when you press shift five times, you get that annoying pop-up and a beep that says, eh, sticky keys has been enabled. Well, people have been known to replace that executable that runs with command prompt or something like that. And when you're in a lock screen, when you're in the Windows login screen, if you press shift five times, boom, that command prompt pops up. And that command prompt is system level access. It's full level access to that computer. So now you have full access to that computer without any passwords or anything. So if you've ever Googled how to reset a Windows password, the top solution is going to be this, doing exactly what I just explained, is replace setHD.exe or utilman.exe with cmd.exe. And then what you can do is reboot your computer, press shift five times, and you have full control of that computer as system on a command prompt without having to log in or anything. Uh, and then from there, you can like net user, you can change a password, you can add a new user, you can do, and boom, you can log in. Uh, the problem is nobody, and I'm not gonna say nobody, but many people don't clean up after themselves. Once they get into the computer, like, yes, I'm in, they forget to clean it up. They do their job and they just completely forget. Uh, and not only that, but it's often used as a, a backdoor or persistent method. So I think Metasploit has a module to implement this. Uh, uh, APT1 has been known to use this as a persistent method because you can RDP to a box and shift five times and you have full control of that box. Um, there are no Windows event logs that are generated. There's no logs that say, hey, someone replaced this file. Um, so, and there's no logs when it's executed easy, e e either. Like you press shift five times, command prop pops up, there's no logs that are gonna be generated from that. Um, and in my opinion, this should be treated as indicator of compromise. If you ever find a box with this replaced with cmd.exe, with this backdoor in place, treat it as an indicator of compromise. Because it's one of two things. It's either one, some system administrator or some user violated, probably violated a process to put a backdoor in the computer, or two, they've been compromised and some malicious insider, some malicious malware or whatever implemented this backdoor for persistence. Uh, just real quick, you'll have these slides, but there's many different executables you can replace to implement this backdoor. Those are online, uh, the slides are online. Um, so Red Team, what can you do? Well, what can you do for finding these backdoors? Uh, because again, these are persistent backdoors that probably someone else has already done. So as a Red Teamer, my job is to just find someone else's backdoor and use it for my advantage. So try each box you touch. If you ever have a Windows box, RDP to it and press it five times. If, if you see a command prompt, you're in. You're probably not gonna find it because it's not that common, but it, I, have, I have found it that way once. Um, you can also hit window key U, that's another shortcut for another executable. Uh, all, all of them just like in the table before. Um, or you can do a network wide scan. Uh, uh, a coworker and I wrote the, this tool called Sticky Key Slayer based off Zach Grace's Sticky Key Hunter uh, that will uh, actually scan the network for these, uh, any of these back doors. So what you do is you pull a list of Windows machines from the Active Directory, just like I, uh, I showed before, and you use my script CD key slayer, which is on GitHub, uh, to uh, give it that list. And what it'll do is it'll RDP to, it'll remote desktop to all those servers, and it'll manually, like scripted, press those keyboard shortcuts, take screenshots, and compare, and do some image analysis whether uh, a command prop popped up. Uh, there's kind of a command to do it. Let's just show you the video. Is it playing? Let's see. Play. Oh, it is playing. Uh, so I've got, I've got, I'm just running the scripts with uh, telling it to do eight threads, do it against this list, and you'll see, you'll see a bunch of machines pop up. It's actually RDPing to them, and you'll see it's trying, it's, it's hitting those keyboard shortcuts, and you can see one popped up in the back. There's a command prompt in the back. And once that's done with the entire list, it's gonna save all those screenshots. It's gonna put the screenshots of the one it thinks command prompt uh, popped up on, and it's gonna put those in a different folder so you can check that folder to see if you have full system access, full remote access to a computer. So now that the scan's done, I'm gonna open up the uh, file, the folder where all the screenshots are. Those are all the screenshots. None of those are vulnerable, just normal. But if I go to the discovered folder, there's, uh, what am I doing? I don't even know. There's all the machines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven machines that I have full access to from someone else's back door. Now I can do whatever I want to that machine. And that machine's joined on the domain. So now I can go over there, steal domain creds, 
and laterally move on the network. Super easy, like right? I just full remote access. How is that not? So I also we also did an internet wide scan, scanned 100,000 IPs from Comcast Business, found 573 servers with full like just RDP to it, and you have full access to it. So is that not awesome, right? Super. One of them was from a, 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 a Ivy League college, Ivy League University. Blue team. So what can we do? Detection. Well, Blue Team can also use a tool like this. It's not a dangerous tool. It's not doing anything except looking for them and reporting on them. So you guys can run this tool as well. Um, and also, if you have the ability, you can alert on excessive RDP traffic. If you have like NetFlow analysis, if someone is RDPing to a bunch of boxes like using this tool, you can alert, uh, uh, generate alerts for that. Protection. There's a lot of things you can do. If you ever find a box that's infected or that has this backdoor in place, immediately delete the, the executable or replace it. Um, that way that it won't launch when people try to you know, run the shortcut. Uh, of course, the, the usual thing to do is restrict local administrative access. In order to implement this backdoor, the person will need to have administrative access to the box. So if you just have the con good practice of restricting that, then it's harder for people to implement. Enable full disk encryption. If someone has a laptop, if they have physical access to the laptop, they can take the hard drive out and actually manipulate the contents of the hard drive to implement this uh, vulnerability without booting the operating system. So if you enable full disk encryption, it's going to help prevent against that. And then, of course, network level authentication. NLA is a uh, security, security feature for RDP that forces people to authenticate to RDP before they're ever given back a console. So if NLA is enabled, it's not going to fix the vulnerability, but it's going to prevent Sticky Key Slayer, for example, from running because there's no creds on that, and it won't be able to actually get a console. So uh, consider looking into that. All right, so low-hanging fruit, I'm still good on time. Uh, Post-authentication, so this is now what attackers would do, the common issues when you're, when you're authenticated, when you have credentials, like we've stolen credentials many times before. What can we do? Well, first, excessive local administrators. Um, who here knows, like, does every uh, work for a company where everyone has admin access to their machine? We've got one hand, and I know everyone, two hands, three hands, good, because I was going to say you're lying if it's just one hand. Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of uh, uh, organizations that just give admin access to everyone, and you guys can kind of guess why that's dangerous. Users should not, in my opinion, should not have admin access by default, uh, because that can be a danger. Like if someone has admin access to the machine, and let's say they need help, they, and IT support remote connect, connects remotely to their machine, well, now that user, if they know what they're doing, can steal the credentials of that IT support dude and get admin access to even more machines, right? Uh, so you usually shouldn't have admin access by default, and group memberships are often overlooked. So make sure when you're looking, when you're auditing your local admins, you're, aud you're looking for group memberships as well and seeing who's members of those groups. You can kind of see that screenshot over there. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with the screenshot, what the problem with the screenshot is? I'll give like five seconds. David, I'm counting on you. So this is, yes, this is the domain controller, and I checked the local administrators group. Who has member, membership to the local administrator group? Domain users. That means every single user in this 50,000 employee environment is a domain administrator, and they had no idea. Uh, so... System administrators may forget to clean up temporary administrators. They may uh, temporarily assign an, an, an admin account, but they don't clean it up because they may forget. And uh, in my opinion, as it, a good practice, system administrators should use multiple accounts for different purposes, right? Instead of having one account for, for like their personal email and their administrative tasks, have do two different accounts to separate those duties to minimize uh, uh, risk, right, and exposure. So red team, what can we do? Well, we can do credential spay. Let's say we get credentials uh, from the environment, like one of the techniques we discussed earlier. Well, one thing you can do is you can spray, spray those credentials, pretty much authenticate to every box you can and check if you have admin access. That'll work, and that'll tell you where you have admin access, but it's also kind of dirty and slow and noisy, uh, and you have to authenticate to every box. Uh, steps, you obtain domain credentials, attempt to log into every box and repeat for every, yeah, once you get a new set of credentials, you gotta do it all again. I try to authenticate every box. Uh, there's a better way to do it for the red teamers, uh, and, and this is a better way of, uh, it's, it's doing a more targeted attack. What you do when you're on an engagement is 
use a, I, I created a tool called Admin Access Finder and you can check it out. But what it does is you first authenticate to every box as a, a, just with your normal domain credentials and use PowerView. Who, you know, PowerView is a, power, uh, it's a PowerShell script that will pull the local administrators for all of those boxes. And that's something you can do is, it's not malicious, it's just normal, it's how AD works. So you pull the local administrator uh, uh, memberships for every one of the boxes on the domain just once and store that to a CSV. And then you can use my PowerShell script. And what my PowerShell script will do is it'll query that CSV, you give it a, uh, a domain credentials like JDO, and it'll query that CSV and tell you every box on the, no on the domain that JDO has admin access on. And it, it won't only check JDO himself, but it'll check JDO's groups and JDO's groups of groups. It'll check the nested membership groups to see if any of those groups are an admin somewhere. And it'll report, yes, JDO has admin to this box. Um, and so that's kind of what I, what I talked about there. Uh, the, the demo is kind of going to be hard. So I'm just going to show the video instead. Uh, so, so I'm just importing, you know, doing the PowerShell stuff to set it up. Uh, so you have import module active directory. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling the computers. Is that what I'm doing? Uh, I don't even remember what I'm doing. Oh, I'm, I'm just importing my PowerShell script, invoke admin access finder. And I'm saying admin access finder jdo. And it's going to import the CSV that we generated earlier that you only have to generate once. And now it's telling you jdo has admin access to this one box. Imagine this is like a, a, a network with like thousands of nodes. Well, now we know JDO has admin access to this one box, and we can go attack that box. Well, we don't even have to attack it. We can just log into that box. We have admin access, and we can continue moving laterally on the network because we have admin access. So super simple. Check it out. Uh, it's useful for targeted attacks. So blue team, what can we do? Detect. Alert on multiple successful logins from one IP address. This is something we talked about before. Uh, if you have a lot of successful logins from one IP, consider investigating that. Uh, and then protect. Minimize number of administrator of accounts. It's kind of obvious. To, like, if you don't need, if everyone doesn't have to be local admin, minimize that. And then limit administrator of accounts to specific computers. Some admins don't have to be admins everywhere. They can be admins to specific computers. And then, of course, regularly audit local administrators. Uh, look at the administrator accounts, uh, uh, where they have access to, or who is listed as admin on the memberships, and just regularly create a, a schedule once a few, every, once every two weeks where you're looking to make sure only the right people have access to it. So, Kerberos, who's heard of this attack? It's an awesome name, Kerberos. David, you're raising your hand for everything. Yeah, Kerberos, it's an awesome name. This one is a really, like, the way this attack works is very technical, but I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna have time to go through all of it, so I'm gonna do a very high level. Um, but it's not an exploit, it's just taking advantage of how Active Directory and how Kerberos works as a protocol. So SPNs, S SPNs is pretty much a record that maps a service, like MySQL, to a service account, like, let's say, the MySQL service account. Uh, well, those, those SPNs, uh, uh, all, uh, every service account in the uh, Active Directory has an SPN associated with it, uh, and those SPNs, uh, you can pull Kerberos tickets for those SPNs. And those Kerberos tickets are encrypted with those service account passwords. What can go wrong, right? Again, you can pull every service account Kerberos ticket, and that's encrypted with that service account's password. So what you can do is you can ask the domain, hey, give me all your service accounts. Give me all your SPNs. And the domain will give them to you because that's just how, how Kerberos works. So sure, it'll give it to you, and those will be encrypted with those passwords. You can pull those tickets from those SPNs, pull those passwords, and send those tickets to a password cracker of your choice, like Hashcat. Hashcat was recently updated to, uh, to be able to crack these. So once you, once you send them to a cracker, if you're lucky, you can get those passwords out, and now, um, uh, now you have access to whatever box those service accounts have access to. Um, you don't need any administrative access or anything to do this kind of attack. You just need a normal authenticated user on the domain. Um, service accounts are often privileged. So if you get a service account password out of this, then you actually have uh, admin access to a box usually because those accounts usually have admin access. And then I've seen plenty of times where, David, have you ever seen this, where service accounts are domain admin? 
I've seen them a lot, where service accounts, like a SQL service account is a domain name for whatever reason. So now you have full access to domain, so that's crazy. Uh, Red Team, what can you do? Uh, invoke Kerberos. It's a nice PowerShell script that'll do this for you. It's really quickly. There's this really like complex technique. It does it like that. So you use Invoke Kerberos. It'll pull all those SPNs and just save them to a file. And then once you have those SPNs, send them to a cracker. These uh, John the Ripper and Hashcat will just automatically recognize it and start cracking it. Once you have it, use the script that I showed you earlier. Invoke Admin Access Finder. Find out if that service account has admin access anywhere, and then access it. Uh, and then log in to the box, and now you have full access. So let's do that real quick. Let's do that. Okay, so handy PowerShell console. So I've already imported the script. It's on GitHub, invoke Kerberos. So what I'm going to do is invoke Kerberos. Boom. Uh, actually, I had some, I think I had some, uh, uh, what is it? Okay, let's do it again. Invoke Kerberos. So I'm going to invoke Kerberos, and I'm going to export it to a CSV. Uh, but I'll show you what it looks like, actually. Uh, curb, curb roast. There it is, and FL. There, format it so you can see it. So you can see in this, in this domain, I have one SPN, because it's a small test domain. But you can see that the service account is uh, a service account for service, service 03. And here is the hash, the actual hash for that service account. So now what I can do is I can take that to John the Ripper. Uh, let's go to my John the Ripper here. Let's see, just root, tools, John, run. So take that VP, put it in a file. So there's that, uh, that service account hash to file, and just tell John to crack it. So let's get John and just crack the hash. No wordless or anything, just crack it. Oh, and it already immediately just got it because the password is password one. So, so now I have full access to that service account. I can find out where that service account can log in, if it has admin, and uh, now, now I have full access to those computers. So that's how easy it is to crack service account passwords. So what can we do to mitigate, to mitigate the risk of this? Well, you can't fix this. This is how Kerberos works. Uh, but what you can do is, first for the detection, detecting Kerberos is it, it's beyond me. It's really, there's a lot of things you can do. So instead of trying to go over it, I have linked on this PowerPoint to Sean McCall's uh, adsecurity.org blog, where he has a really, really like in-depth two-page article on how you can detect these kind of attacks. Um, you can even employ honeypots. If you, if you have honeypot service accounts, fake service accounts with weak passwords, and someone uses it, then you know, hey, someone's doing something bad. Um, but protection, that's key. Increased password strength for service accounts. These are service accounts, they're not user accounts. So you can have really long passwords, longer than 25 characters, super complex, uh, where, where you don't need to authenticate every day, just maybe once when you're configuring the service. So have a really strong password on those, and that's gonna completely mitigate. You, 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 Hashcat won't be, probably won't be able to crack this password, a 25 character password, in under, what, 20 billion, trillion years, whatever the large D number is. Uh, and then manage service accounts. This is something I, don't, I actually don't have a lot of experience with, but the, uh, the latest Active Directory has introduced something called managed service account, which is kind of an automatic password management of service accounts. You can, I think there's a link at the end of this where you can read a Microsoft article on what that is and how you can implement that. Um, so I think this might be the last one. I'm done boring you guys. Uh, but SharePoint. Who here uses SharePoint? Raise your hands, yes. Or Wikipedia or any sort of knowledge sharing uh, service uh, on your network. SharePoint holds a lot of information and people often don't pay attention to what they upload. They may upload some sensitive documents without even knowing it. Uh, I find things all the time such as security documents, like how, how a server is configured, uh, source code, config files, credentials, private information, and proprietary company data. I have found the craziest shit on SharePoint. Uh, what, is, what is the craziest thing? PayPal credentials. PayPal credentials to their golf tournament, with which I logged into, uh, $125,000 in the PayPal account. And I found those credentials in a Word document by searching SharePoint. So what did I do? Like I, I can kind of give you some examples. So to search, search for stuff like common passwords. See what you get. You might not get something. You might not get anything, but you might get something. So search common passwords like that. Winter, uh, 
some spring 2016, winter 20, star, whatever, you can actually use wild cards uh, to, to look for things. Um, this is my favorite, the keyword, the near keyword. Most people don't know about this, but if you do a word with near in all caps and another word, it's going to search for any documents with those words within four words from each other. So that's how I found the PayPal credentials, because I searched PayPal near password, and I found a document that had a PayPal account and password in it. Um, you can even search like company.com near password or whatever, like, like uh, what I was saying with PayPal. Um, oh yeah, that, that's kind of, an, that's not the, uh, the account, but that's kind of an example of what I found. Uh, and then you can even search for emails uh, or super secret data, like the secret Coke formula if you're doing a pen test for Coca-Cola uh, or doing a pen test for Pepsi and you're seeing if they've already stolen it. Uh, or search host names. If you want to find out how a, a server is configured, someone probably has like a document or an email or, or something that explains, hey, this domain controller is configured in this specific way. There's a lot of valuable information to find there. Um, so blue team, what can you do? Detect. Well, I mean, there's really no detective. You, again, you're not exploiting anything. But manually search for this information. Uh, if you have a proprietary sense of the data, run a search every once in a while, see if you find anything. Maybe someone uploaded something they didn't realize they uploaded, or the permissions weren't set right. Uh, and then set up SharePoint alerts. SharePoint does have the ability to uh, do alerts where you can have it, uh, give it a keyword, and it'll regularly search that keyword and email you when there's uh, new results for that. So that's a really useful tool to, to use. And then, of course, protect, ensure file permissions and classifications like proprietary, confidential, classified, et cetera. Ensure those are set properly so that if you have important documents to SharePoint, they're not shared to everyone. And of course, just up avoid uploading sensitive data if you really don't have to. Um, and then encrypt the documents that you really need to be up there. Have valid encryption uh, uh, so that you prevent unauthorized people from looking, uh, using these files. So. With eight minutes to spare, I'm probably already over, actually. Summary, quick summary, build an inventory of your computer assets and your resources, because you need to know what's there in order to protect it. Uh, implement good security controls. We talked about things like password policy, secure configuration, and user and permissions management. Those things can be done without spending money, without buying these fancy tools, and those things should be done first before anything else. And then segment your most important assets. Like I said, put, different, put more important servers in a different network to mitigate uh, risks or impact. Uh, and then regularly, this is important, regularly train employees to have good security practices at home and at work. Because if you don't have good security practices at home, you're not going to have good security practices at work. So tell people, you know, don't click links that you don't need to click on. Uh, don't, uh, uh, don't have weak passwords. Don't share your passwords. Uh, and then this is even more important, that's why I bolded it, regularly train your systems administrators to have good security practices. They have the keys to the kingdom. They have all the, the access to all the data, all the servers. Make sure they are always trained on the latest and greatest with the security practices. Allow them to go to conferences like this. Uh, allow them to go to other conferences to see what's out there and to talk to people like us to, to learn this kind of things and to, to learn to be good and, and, and protect your company. So. That's all I got. Very easy, right? Sorry for the boring. It's too easy. Sorry for the boringness, but uh, any questions? Any questions at all? Uh, you don't have to have questions now, but if you ever have any questions ever, you can c come up to me, or you can tweet me, or hit me up, or whatever. I've got business cards. Yes, questions? Um, so, uh, quarterly password changes, it's like a requirement Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a, there's, absolutely, I mean, I do that, right? I'm not going to come up with a new password. I just keep adding a number to it. But there, there's, there is a big debate on whether you should force people to recycle passwords every 30 days or so, because you're right. All it does is encourage people to either just come up with predictable patterns or just, like I've done before, keep changing the password over and over again until I get to use the same one again. Uh, so, so it's a big debate. Uh, we can talk about it and debate it, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it, we're still trying to figure out what's best. And then last question before I have to go. I'd love to see it. <laughs> Worse than six characters? Uh, Nothing else? <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. 
show them why it's bad. Give them, a, give them a nice demo. Like a lot of people don't want to be scared into seeing things, but if you show them a nice fancy demo where like, I like to show off Metasploit where you take a picture of their, their, uh, their, their webcam, something like that, uh, uh, that'll kind of scare them in a cool way. They'll be like, holy crap, a weak password causes this to happen? And then you know, they can see how that impact can, they can impact their life and their home and everything. And so I think showing them and kind of scaring them, but showing them something cool is the best way to get attention across to people who are just brick walls and don't want to, don't care to fix anything. Also, state agencies, so probably won't have an agency. Yeah, state agencies. So anyways, yeah, I'm so sorry. So slides, the tools, all this is online. Uh, you can take a picture of that. My slides are up there. Thank you very much.